Okay. Welcome to all those who are joining us online. Um, and um, we'll have a, um, a, a time of questions and a couple of questions from my side. So let's get started. Let me uh, pray and ask the Lord's continued blessing. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we are so grateful that um, you have given us a desire. I know that everyone has this desire. All, all that you've called to yourself have this desire. It, it sometimes is, it, 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 it needs to be um, cultivated. And that's what we're wanting to do is to cultivate our love for your word, our desire to know your word better, to, to loosen the soil, if you will, to fertilize it, to water it so that it grows in us. And as it grows in us, we, we grow as well um, and we go, grow closer to you. So I pray that you'll bless this time together, bless all those who are either here in person or um, uh, plugging in on the internet to enjoy this time of continuing to go deeper into your word. We'll give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, uh, first of all, we can start out with uh, some questions that you might have, some thoughts that you might have about some of the very poignant um, things that we talked about earlier. Yes, ma'am, Miss Candy. Now, I'm going to repeat your question because we only have one camera today, okay? Okay. I had been taught at one time that uh, it will be um, the determinant of what rewards we get. Uh, the question is, will the judgment be, for Christians, be a determining factor of the rewards that we get? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, yes in the fact that um, all things will be revealed at the judgment, all things will be known. But no in the sense that your rewards are by that time actually going to be decided. In other words, it's what you do here. And, and that's what Paul uh, makes clear is, yes, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ um, and our, our treasure that we have stored up for ourselves in heaven has been stored up by what we do and, and how we live out a, a life for Christ. So yes, I, I imagine that it would be there that things would be determined, but really it's what we do here. It's, it's, it's what we do while before we actually get to that point. Okay, yeah, so um, an excellent question, but I think that the emphasis should be on the here and now, okay? Because there's not going to be any argument. <laughs> hey, wait a minute! I I did this, you know. None. It, it, all will be uh, all will be revealed at that time. Okay. Yes, ma'am, Miss Miss Penny. A couple of thoughts, and you know that idea is, is very humbling, and I, and I think that the idea that you brought out that you know when we look at ourselves, and that's who we, that's really who we look at first. Right. Right. And that's not always easy to do. Right. You know? And then to, to remember that we're forgiven and we, that we need to recognize our, our sin is so atrocious to us. And we recognize, how can we still have these thoughts? How can we still <laughs> do some things? And how, how are we doing that and not have a broken heart about it? Yeah. Let me, let me stop you so I can... Because we don't, we don't have a, a, an, an, another microphone. So what uh, Patty is saying is the, uh, the humbling effect that this has on us uh, when we think about um, applying these things to ourselves and not applying them outside of ourselves. But, but, and, and that's the whole reason that I chose that way to go, th that application. Because before we can look at others and find the speck in their eye, we've got to find the beam in our own eye. And we don't like to think of ourselves as being hypocritical. In fact, that's a very negative word as far as Christians are concerned. And that's why I, I kind of wanted to qualify it by the strict letter of the meaning of the word. We are hypocrites. I, I'm a hypocrite because anytime I do something that is different 
than what I believe and what I profess and what I know to be true. And, and, and I don't do that in a sense, I'm being hypocritical. Um, and, and so it, it really does be, begin with us. And, and, and that's the health of a church. That, that's the health of, of this, because so often, uh, I was just having a conversation there. There, there was a, a, a lady oh, years ago, none of you know her, um, who, uh, who was at this church, and every single sermon that I preached, she would come out and say, they needed to hear that. I'm glad you said that. They needed to hear that. And I'm thinking, uh, you're the one. If there's anyone who needs to hear it, you know, you're because I'm talking about judgmentalism and, and oh, they need to hear it. And, and it's always someone else that needs to hear it but ourselves. And so that's why we really need to start with ourselves and to, to be brutal with ourselves. And, and, and that's one of the, the real pleasures of Christianity, isn't it? that we can be brutal with ourselves, we can be honest with ourselves, and see ourselves for who we are without pretension, without trying to make ourselves look better than we are, because our real worth is in Christ. It's, it's in Him. That, that's where our righteousness and our worth is, is in Him. So, yes, a good point. And you said you had a, a second one that I cut you off. You probably forgot it now. said and I couldn't respond back with mm -hmm. her. She said as she had her abortion it was sorrowful about that. Not sorrowful she wasn't. She says God loves me no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't need to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. But we were telling her about I was we had to present the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mercy and, and judgment coming. But God's offering you mercy now. Mm -hmm. And that's what she, and I thought well part of that is true. God does love mm -hmm. us no matter what we do but is that but there's the other side of that. But, mm -hmm. you know, when they're driving, someone's driving out, I'm just, so I pray for her. I'm just still praying for her. Yeah. Where does she even do that? Well, it's taught. It, it's the it's the primary teaching. Let me repeat what uh, what Patty has just said. She works uh, outside um, outside an abortion clinic as a missionary to try to speak to those um, ladies who are going for abortion. And one particular lady came out this time, uh, and rather than hearing anything about God's mercy and love, she said, "God loves me anyway, regardless of what I do, even if I've just murdered a, a, a life." Um, and, and unfortunately, when when we teach when a pastor teaches grace only and, and, and grace alone with no accountability, no obedience, no uh, standards, no kingdom ethics, but just hammers, 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 hey, God loves you and no matter what you do, you're forgiven. Um, well, there are some criteria to that forgiveness and, and you know it as well as I do, but they don't. That it's like taking the outside without the inside because what has to happen is that the inside has to be transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. You have to be a new creation in Christ and guess what? That new creation knows that they are sinful before God and that is murder and they're mortified by what they've done or what they might have done in their past and they need forgiveness and they recognize that but without the transforming work of the Holy Spirit they, they just pick out, hey, this is what I want to hear. This is a good part. It's all good, you know? God loves me no matter what. I remember a sign, it was, it was an iconic sign um, at, at a, 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 a gay rally in a very, very, really ridiculously dressed transvestite was carrying a sign, Jesus loves me more than he loves you. You know, he, he would like me more than he would like you. In, in other words, I'm the kind of person Jesus hung around with. Well, it, uh, you know, yeah, go your way and sin no more. You know, not to condone the sins, but that has been picked up by the popular culture that, that, uh, that anything goes and Jesus loves me anyway. Well, guess who's to blame for that? It's not the popular culture, it's the church. It's being taught. That's what's being taught in, in the, and in, in fact, if I, if I have time, that's one of the things I want to talk about is, okay, 
in light of today's message, what is being taught out there? And how does it fit in to what Jesus has just said? So, excellent, excellent thought. And you just met Miss Candy again. Mm-hmm. And, and um, are selective in what they pick out of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't feel like, you know, people who profess Christianity but, uh, you know, don't believe everything in the Bible to me are mm-hmm. not Christians. And, I, and they're the people who infuriate me the most. Mm-hmm. And I find myself judging and getting angry. Is All right. That, um, uh, so, so Candy, Candy is, is confessing to us um, that she gets angry and judges people who are sloppy in their Christianity um, and take things for granted and um, uh, have false doctrines and things like that that they bring into the church. Um, I will remind you that uh, Matthew 7 says, judge not lest you also be judged. But he's not saying, do not use discernment. Because it just, he's going to turn right around and say, don't throw your pearls before swine. How can you determine whether a person is a swine if you don't at least judge a little bit? Right? Jesus spent more time talking about hypocrisy and false doctrine and false religion within the church than he did about the pagan culture. You're not going to hear Jesus talking an awful lot about the pagan culture. Jesus talking about hypocrisy within the church, and he did not spare words. He was not polite, socially or politically correct, in the way that he attacked the people who were teaching false doctrines and bringing them into the church. That's exactly what he's warning us against. Now, where the, the, where the issue is, and, and, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth or, 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 or thoughts in your mind, but um, where we go wrong is if we get bitter about that. Righteous anger. Jesus had righteous anger. He, he went in and cleared out the temple, and, and, and he was angry about it um, because they were defiling God. They were profaning God's house. And, and, and so Jesus was upset about that. It is perfectly natural for us to, to be righteous, have righteous anger when we see God's name drugged through the mud, when we see his doctrines profaned, when we see people um, teaching false doctrines within the church. It makes me so angry sometimes that I have a hard time looking at them. And I don't know to the degree that I should know as a pastor what they're teaching because I don't get that far into what they're teaching before I'm just tied up in knots. So I, 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 I'm not going to say that in and of itself to judge sloppiness. You, you know, Candy, you bring up a really good point. There is a sloppiness in the church today. There's a sloppiness of worship. And I'm not talking about clothes. I'm not talking about the, the way that we go about it. But I think it stems, and actually I mentioned this in my prayer, I think I, it stems from the fact that we have lost the fear of God. We have lost the fear of Him. We, we see Him as a buddy and, and as a friend. And, and Jesus says, just another guy on the bus, you know, ju- just like us. And, and, and we don't see Him in His transcendent holiness. And, and if there was one thing that typified Dr. Sproul's ministry, it was to try and get people to understand the holiness of God that God is holy and that guess what? We should fear him and we should have a healthy fear for him. And, and I think people have lost that. So there's no, it doesn't matter how you look. If, the idea of dressing up to go to church is, you know, almost looked down on. And, and you know, I'm very, I, I'm, hey, I, I am okay. I, I, I used to wear jeans and Crocs in the, in the, uh, the, the contemporary service. But then I go to Haiti and I spend time with the Haitians who have one decent suit that they have. And they start on Saturday afternoon preparing themselves for Sunday worship. They go down, they wash those clothes in the river. They iron them with a iron with coals in it because they have no electricity. 
they dress up when they go to church, they look better than we do. Okay? You have suits, you have ties, you have women wearing the most inappropriate dresses. Uh, I mean, wedding dresses is what I'm talking about because they get everything secondhand, you, you know? And, 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 and you know this, I mean, people dress up when they, when they, they go. And, and, and that really hit me. Okay, if they care enough about worship to, to dress for it, why, why, why don't we? So there's a sloppiness, I think, in the way we worship. I think there's a sloppiness in what we expect out of worship. And if you go to a church, which I don't, but if you go to a church where they're having sweepstakes and they're driving cars onto the, the, the um, stage and they've got dinosaur uh, puppets and all those kind of, they're really entertaining you. Well, that, that, that's, that, that is irreverent in my mind. I mean, I don't care whether we have drums on the stage. You know, I've been many places where that's the only thing they have is drums. You know, so I'm not going to get upset about the mode of music or things like that, but it does need to be reverent. We need to have a fear of God. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Naomi, is that your hand up that, that, that is there? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I just wanted to respond to what the sister was talking about when she gets angry. And um, that, that's exactly what we're supposed to do as Christians. Um, you know, when in Matthew 7, where it said, Judge you not that you might not be judged, but if you continue to read, it tells you to clean yourself up right. so that you will be able to judge. Right. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, when the man is with, um, with his father's wife, and he says, a little leaven that you spoke right. this morning. Yeah. Uh, you know, make it well, leavens the whole leaven lump. the whole lump. The whole lump. So what happens is as Christians we see sin and we don't do anything about right. it. We turn our face. Right. But that's exactly the scripture also teaches Wait a minute, pause, pause. We have to judge the ones that are within the church. And God would judge those outside of the church, and we have a complete opposite. Yeah. We're trying to judge the world. Right. We should be judging the, the, the church. Uh, the reason I was going to stop you is because this is kind of like translating. When someone's translating for you, if you get too far abo uh, away, they forget everything you said at the beginning. Uh, and so I'm trying to tell the people at home what, what, what you said. So, uh, again, Naomi is pointing out that... Um, that when, when, when uh, Matthew 7 says, judge not lest you also be judged, which by the way is now the most quoted verse yeah. by pagans outside of the church. Yeah. Used to be John 3.16, now it's, it, it's that one. They, they love that. But later on in that same chapter, Jesus talks about cleaning ourselves up. John talks about discerning the spirits, being able to discern between right and wrong. A whole part of our sanctification is that we come to know what is right and what is good and what is not. And you made an excellent point that, you know, too often, and I hear this all the time within the church, that we're always pointing to the culture. We're looking at all those wicked and evil people out there, and they are. They're wicked and evil. And the things that are happening out there are beyond belief right now. But our focus needs to be on the church. And even beyond that, our focus needs to be on ourselves first. We need to start with us. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, the reason the culture acts like the culture is because they don't have Jesus. And, and, and if we have Jesus and we're trying to act like the culture, boy, we have got problems. You know, we have got problems because all you got to do, all you got to do, all you have to do is read scripture and you see where the really harsh judgment comes upon the people. It's not the pagan culture. It's God's people who are letting the culture into the church over and over again. Old Testament, New Testament is the same way. When God really brings judgment upon a people group, it's always his own people. Or, you know, the Amorites as, as well. Yeah. Those are excellent points. Yes, ma'am. Miss Janet, you have your eye. I was reading in Joshua this morning, uh, Joshua 24, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And he talks about putting away those gods. Um, and, uh, and, of course, at the end, he adds, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he's out there. There are issues. Janet is reading from 2414 in Joshua. 
um, a, a quite famous where he says to the to, to his own people and that's kind of revealing isn't it mm -hmm. that he's telling them to put away the gods that their fathers worship so mm -hmm. idol worship was a part of what they were doing and God God brought them out of Egypt anyway you know and, and a large part of what they have done and the reason that God got angry at them eventually the whole 40 years in the desert was because they were not they were not just not worshiping him they were worshiping the other gods now the reason that he wanted them to destroy men women and child in Canaan was so that they would not fall prey to the other gods which they did by marrying and bringing that in so in 2414 it says now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord going down to the 15th verse at the very end of it but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord great um, statement for everyone's house to have that someplace in it as for me and my house we will serve the Lord so um, uh, excellent. Yes, sir, Brother yeah, um, I, I, Preston. I wanted, to, I wanted to say was a few things, but the way of um, the ways of sin, sin is death. Right. And then it's like this morning when you when you said that I'm a an hypocrite, and and I mentioned that it, it was just a shock to me. I'm sure it was a shock to everybody else. But see, with truth makes people change mm -hmm. whereas I'm thinking now I'm saying okay I'm, 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 I'm saying what I'm saying I'm a hypocrite also but now through through uh, you know I guess through prayer and you know the scriptures talk about prayer cease you know prayer you know continuously prayer right but then the change from from that hypocrite state what do I need to do I know I need to change when I say when I say something and I don't do it, but right. But but what what um. Uh well, what, and, and, and what Preston is, is saying that he was shocked when I said, I'm a hypocrite. Uh, I don't know why you're shocked, but, uh, you know, I'm a sinner. Uh, and, and, and sinners act one way and do another. I mean, Paul himself said, you know, hey, who's going to release me from this body of death? The very thing I want to do is the very thing I don't do. So, I mean, boy, I tell you what, if he's got problems along this line, then I don't feel so bad about mine. You know, well, well, you know that no, that part I know. I know we 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 are that you know, right. We are that way, but it, it's it's just this as as you as the shepherd of this congregation admit that, then you know it's like follow me as I follow Christ. You know, as I follow Christ, right. follow me. Right. So therefore, and the only thing you do is just strengthen the whole body. Right. Because because of, of your truthfulness. Okay. About it, you know. So, so, so he was actually giving me a compliment. Yeah. Um, he, he, he was saying that yeah. that kind of truthfulness is healthy for the body of Christ. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and what gets me, brother, and I appreciate that so much, how could it be any other way? Seriously, how, how could it be any other way? How could any, I mean, it, it, when you go to the scripture and you see Paul, he, he, he's straightforward about who he is. And, and Peter and all the rest, they're 100% straightforward. I mean, there's nothing hidden. How, how, how could I put on any airs that I'm anything else but? A, a, a sinner and, and a hypocrite. So, uh, and, and, and don't get that, don't take that word and run with it, you, you know, because it, it, I'm using that word very literally. We're, we're hypocrites literally because by the purest definition of the word, but our whole life is designed to follow Christ, to be like Christ. And that is what is so different about us as Christians is because we actually want the light. We, we want to find those dark areas to pull up the stones in our heart, let all those little critters that are there run out and get burned up in the light. Because we want God to see what we're, what we're doing that, that is wrong so that we can, we, we can be more like Christ, so that we can grow beyond it, grow out of it. Because no real Christian, no born again Christian, 
wants in their heart to sin, wants to keep on sinning. And John says that if you harbor that love for sin in your heart and you say you're a Christian, then you lie and the truth is not in you. Yeah, because see, you, 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 like for me, the state, the lifestyle I was living, if I didn't admit that I, there was the issue, yeah. then I couldn't. Could I? Absolutely, you can't. You, it's absolutely, if he's if if he's living a life of of substance abuse, right. which I did for 20 years, and, and and by the way, as you know, it's really hard to take yourself seriously after that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's really it's hard to look on yourself and say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm I've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, you know what you're capable of, and you know who it was who redeemed you and brought you out of that and saved you. So there's no ever, never any question, and, and and in that I'm blessed, in in that, and so are you. That the Lord, yeah, the Lord has shown you what you're capable of doing on your own. So there's no pretension at all, um, because if without Him, I'd be right back there. Same yeah. Same yeah. yeah. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Holy Spirit gives you more, more strength to fight against it. Mm -hmm. You're more aware that every time it comes to the moment that you are going to sin, then immediately you recognize that you are not going to do it. A absolutely you excellent point. Enemy, because, no, I'm yeah. not going to do it. Yeah. And he will give you the strength. Amen, amen. It is a process, and, and what she was pointing out is that the more that you, when you sin, the more that you confess that sin, recognize it, and say, Lord, I want to do something about it, the easier it becomes, or the stronger you become. The stronger you are in resisting the next time that the enemy comes right there. Let, 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 let me give you one caveat to that, though. Let me give you an exception to that rule, because our our, our sanctification, which is exactly what you're talking about, is sanctification, is not necessarily linear. And as Christians, we need to know that. It will save you a lot of anguish. Because every now and then, you're just going along really good, and you're resisting that devil really good, and everything is going good, and all of a sudden, God says, okay, we're going to have a test. You know what I mean? Now, I'm just going to remove my hand there for a minute, and I'm just going to see how you fare. And well, sometimes we fall apart. Yeah, right. and, and how many of us have not said to ourselves, I can't believe I did that. Right. That is so not me. It is so not Christian. I failed that test. Yeah. Right? And the Lord says, okay, good. So you know. So, so you made an F. Right? Next time you'll make it a D or a C, and, and you'll get better and better. So sometimes, he really, we, we feel like we just fell apart. And what the enemy wants us to do at that time was not only to give up, to doubt your salvation. To doubt, my, okay, uh, this isn't the way that Christians act. You know, I, I mean, I, I can't do something like that or think something like that and be a Christian at the same time. Uh, and that's one of the ways the Lord keeps us humble and, and teaches us. They're tests. Tests are for a reason. And it's good, helpful, if you begin to realize that all of a sudden I am in a whirlwind, I'm being tested. Yes. It helps you deal with it. it. It helps you look for the enemy because you know that's when he attacks you, you know, when you're, when you're weak, when, when, when you're in those situations. So it's nice to know that God never stops testing you. And he does it not to punish you, to grow you, to build you up, to strengthen you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. Panjau. The beautiful part about it, our God is a merciful God. He is a merciful God. He does. Because every time I fall and I go to him to ask for forgiveness, yes. he always open his eyes. Amen. 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 Pancho says, thank God that God is a merciful God. And every time he falls, he's there to pick him up. And you know something, I think one of the most tragic things that happens to Christians is to lose the balance between a God we fear and a God who is merciful. 
because we tend to want to go to one side or the other, right? So if we fear him, then all of a sudden he becomes bitter and angry and, and you know, people don't want to, you know, they're afraid of him in the wrong way. But then we go too far to the merciful side and we forget that he's a God for us to fear and we just take it for granted. As Candy was saying earlier, people get really sloppy in their religion. But we need to recognize that the more we understand God's holiness, okay, here we are, here we are on this little plane way down here. And if God is like this, then the mercy that he extends to us is, wow, that's not really that great. But if God is beyond what we can even imagine, that's his perfect holiness. The fact that he is merciful to us, the more holy God is, the more mercy he has, the more grace he has to, 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 to love a sinner like me. So the whole idea of bringing God down to our level is to destroy his grace and his mercy. We don't understand that. They say, oh, you make this judgmental God. No, a judgmental God is a gracious God because otherwise he wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have Jesus, you know? So yeah, so we, we need to keep both of those in, in, in the, the right order. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, these are, these are our, our, our great questions. Any more? Yes, ma'am, Miss Rhonda. Um, I'm just thinking that that's one of the, that's really one of the cool things about um, Scripture is the different, especially the New Testament writers who all, um, who all, from their perspective, talk about exactly what we're, what we're saying. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these important concepts, we're not just told once and expected to get it. Right. You know, so, um, right. you know, from John saying, um, uh, if you say that you have that you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. Right. Of our yeah. Potential hypocrisy of you know. Yeah. Wait, you, you're not. You may not be as far along as you're as you're thinking. To Paul, like you said, oh wretched man that I am. Yeah. You know who will say it's you know and 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 everybody in between. It's, yeah. it's so wonderful that that um, that you know from the, the, we're just we're told these things over and over because. Gonna, we're going to mess up again. And yes. Here it is again from another angle, from another perspective. But I think that's also why oh, yeah. um, uh, Paul and the book of Romans is such a treasure because yeah. it's almost like most of the whole book just explains yeah. over and over yeah. of the difference between, you know, um, we're a new creation. Behold, you know, the, the, the old is past, the new has come, you know. Woo -woo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 About it, like every angle that you can possibly consider that 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 book of Romans is so incredible. Absolutely. Well, Rhonda is bringing out a, a, a very, very important and valuable point about Scripture. Is it doesn't just tell us once what it wants us to do. It literally, from cover to cover, we can find the instructions. So when he talks about uh, uh, hypocrisy, when he talks about um, uh, uh, claiming to be Christians but yet living a life of sin, he doesn't just warn us against it once, over and over and over again, and from every different angle that you can imagine. He, he, uh, the, the, the scripture talks about it. Not just the New Testament either. Uh, the Old Testament is, is so instructive that way. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, do you have your, your, your hand up or were you just scratching, scratching uh, Preston's head? <laughs> I have one little point in 2 Timothy. Uh, when it teaches us um, to um, study to show ourselves right and dividing the word of truth. Mm. And when we divide the truth of God that I've recognized, it leaves me out, it leaves you out, our thoughts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really mean anything because when you put this puzzle together, it's only God's word it's, explaining God's absolutely. word. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. She's pointing out that God's word explains God's word. And that, by the way, is the center of hermeneutics. If you don't know what that word means, that just means the way we interpret scripture. And the way that we interpret scripture is we let scripture interpret scripture. And it tells us, it doesn't matter what we think. Okay, it doesn't matter my opinion at all. What matters is what scripture says and, and how clearly God, God has put that. So yes, the, uh, a very, very excellent point there. Um, you know, just talking about the Old Testament and thinking about that. Um, any, we're, we're talking about 
abject hypocrisy. Now we know that Jesus is railing against the, um, uh, the Pharisees in the New Testament. Um, what about some examples of hypocrisy or hypocrites in the Old? Where, where, where are some examples of some, some, uh, some real hypocrisy in the Old? David, uh, in, 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 in what? Well, with regard to uh, um, his affair with Bathsheba and then uh, setting up her husband. To be, to, to be killed. And then, of course, old Nathan comes and tells him that story. That is a story designed to expose a hypocrite. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect. Yes. Who else? Who else? Joseph's brothers, maybe? Joseph's brothers. Uh, in what way? Well, what did, what did they do with his coat of many colors? They put blood on it. They put blood on it. And would let their father for the rest of his life pie and sigh over his favorite son. They let him do that. That's a hypocrite. Yeah. Who else? I'm thinking maybe Solomon. Abraham. Um, being known as the wisest man in the world. Yeah, yeah. Puff up anybody. Yeah, yeah, he absolutely was. David was. What about um, the father of Joseph's brothers? What did he do that was like ultimately hypocritical? He's the one that went into his poor blind father and made himself hairy like his brother so that he could steal his birthright. Okay, yes. Yeah, his, the, mom was not completely an innocent bystander there. Somebody mentioned Abraham. What way? Was, uh, John, uh, was Sarah? Sarah, Sarah was sister. Absolutely. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Abraham is one of the premier saints in the Old Testament. Wait a minute, you're calling him a hypocrite? He was, wasn't he? Give me an example of a hypocrite in the New Testament besides the Pharisees. Give me the, an example of a super saint who was a, who was a hypocrite. Peter. Peter. What did Peter do? He denied Christ. Denied that he knew him. Now, what's the absolute quintessential picture of hypocrisy in the New Testament? <laughs> Judas. And what did Judas do? <laughs> Betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Wow, what, what a hypocrite. I mean, so these are all people inside the church, if you will, in, in, inside this. And so therefore there's, uh, okay, give me an, another. What, what's a famous couple who were hypocrites? Ananias and Sapphira. What's a famous brothers from the Old Testament? Those of you in Wednesday night ought to remember this because we just talked about it. What were two brothers in the Old Testament who were consummate? Hypocrites. Hophni and Phinehas. Yes. Well, they're sleeping with women. They're sleeping with women in the tent, in the tent doors, and then they they take the ark and they're in pomp and ceremony. So, so you you guys were there and you didn't remember it, right? Is that what's going on over there? <laughs> Well, you get a pass because you weren't there on Wednesday night, okay? okay? But we, we, we talked about it. And in fact, in fact, I even mentioned it. I said, I'm going to talk about hypocrisy on Sunday, and these are the perfect examples. And you still forgot it. What am I going to do with you people? I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding you. Okay, um, any questions along that line? Because now we're kind of talking about the manifestations of these things. What we're seeing is, and that's one of the great things about Scripture, and this goes back to what Brother Preston was saying earlier. If we, if we look at Scripture, Scripture is very clear about the way we should be in our own lives because Scripture doesn't, um, what's known as hagiography, it doesn't glorify its saints. 
She gives them to us with all their warts and problems and, and, and bad things that they do, you know. Uh, it, it just gives, a, so we can see them. And so therefore, Scripture is very clear about, okay, these are problems that are going to face the church. Okay, this, they, these are not given to us for no reason. When Jesus says to his disciples, and, and we have that little word first, and unfortunately, I can't ever make as much of a deal about things as I, I would like to. But that little word first, where he first, even in the chaos of a, a huge crowd around him, he first says, no, I'm going to talk to my disciples. Okay, so he pulls that, and he's not just talking to the twelve. I think he's talking to the larger group of disciples who are following them. So first, before he even begins to teach the rest of the crowd, he says, no, this is something I want you. You are the ones who are going to form the backbone of the church. And therefore, I need you to know something that is not just I'm telling you first, but something that is foremost, something that is preeminent as far as the dangers that you will face. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He knew that we would face this. And kind of what I want to do right now is I want to depress you. I don't know about you, but this depresses me. There's something like one and a half, maybe two billion people in the world who call themselves Christians. Okay? Now, I want you to tell me of those which ones have fallen into the leaven of the Pharisees? Which one of those churches we're going to be judgmental for a while? Okay, we're going to be judging. But out of the billions of people in this world who call themselves Christians, remember, what was the specific leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy? What was Jesus specifically talking about? externalized religion, institutionalized religion, okay? Religion that worried about the outside of the cup but not the inside of the cup, that decorates the graves of the prophets and kills the prophets, who, who, who does all of these things, who, who are saying they're the religious leaders and they're plotting to kill the Son of God, all right? External religion, Jesus says beware of that because just a little bit of that, when it begins to sneak into your church, when it gets into your life, we focused on ourselves, but let's talk about the church. When it gets into a church, externalized religion can spread like leaven in a lump of dough. Of the one and a half billion, I'm going to say two billion people on earth who claim to be Christians, um, how many of them have fallen into the leaven of the Pharisees? Would you say that Roman Catholicism has fallen into the leaven of the Pharisees? Yes. Would you say that Roman Catholicism has fallen into an externalized religion where it matters where you worship, it matters who is doing the worship, it matters how you worship, what you take, the sacraments? Okay, that's half. That's over half. That's a billion done right there. Okay, so now we're down from two billion to one billion. I especially okay Pat, Pat, Patty has said uh, something about the the um, the fact that you can have externalized religion by placing everything into the house of worship the beautiful cathedrals that that you have um, personally I'm not I, I don't I don't have a problem with giving our best to God I don't have a problem in, in building magnificent buildings that we worship in. Um, it's just that if that becomes the, the object of your worship and God is not any more than you've made an idol out of that. Because inside, you know, you've got all the statues all over. Oh, yes. Uh, that, th those are, th those are, are actually, they're actually frightening. Um, they're spooky. Um, I've told you about the, the, the cathedral at, at Siena, haven't I? Uh, uh, that that you, you walk in and there's this big huge skylight and they have a, 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 an image of every pope who ever lived up to the time that it was that it was built and they're all looking down at you and the thing about it is 
is that you cannot stand anywhere in that giant cathedral without one pope looking at you. That was by design. That was by design. In, in other words, they did by design. And you talk about kind of getting creepy after a while, because no matter where you stand, you look up there and there's one of these guys staring at you. you know. And that was done by design, but I don't know how I got off on that. <laughs> but, but, you know, and, and, and talk about another thing that happens in Europe. And this is, this is terrible. When we were in Scotland and we were going to some of the great old reform churches, Presbyterian churches that they had built, they're turning them into bars and cafes because there's nothing else you can do with a church building that nobody attends anymore. And, 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 and the other half that are being attended are owned by the state and they pay the pastor to keep it open and to carry on the liturgies. All right, so you're, you're, you're jumping ahead. We, we just had half of the Christians, and, and but trust me, I'm not being judgmental here. I'm not saying that every person who goes to a Catholic church is a non-believer. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that when Jesus warns us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, which is externalized religion, I want you to see how important it was and how poorly it has been looked after. What about Protestantism? Okay, we have half of them that are Catholics. Those are gone. Let's take the Protestant world. Um, mainstream Methodist, mainstream Presbyterian, mainstream uh, Episcopalian, mainstream Lutheran, okay? All of those mainstream Protestant churches have, they externalized religion. How do you get saved? Certainly not by the blood of Jesus. Right, um, right. Because of the fact that uh, the mainstream denomination now accepts... Well, it, it's, it, aside from what they're accepting as far as the culture, their very definition of your salvation is a social gospel. In other words, external. It's what you do. They don't believe in Jesus anymore. They don't believe in the Bible. And some of them don't even believe in God. Do you realize to be a priest in the Episcopalian Church, you don't have to believe in God? Did you know that? You, you don't have to even believe in God, but you can go and you can preach and teach an external religion. So, so you've just taken another third out because that's, that's, that's the mainstream Protestants, okay? That, that, that are dwindling in great numbers, but still about a third of that. How about, and, and I, again, I'm not going to bash charismatics, but how about um, a, a charismatic approach that requires that you A, speak in tongues, that you don't pay attention to this book, but you get whatever you need from the Spirit in an experiential way. Would you call that um, an external religion? Would you call that something that's external to what is actually in the heart uh, and, and, and the largest part of evangelical America is charismatic, okay? You, you, you realize how far we're down now? I mean, we started out this big and now, now we're down here. Of all the people who call themselves Christians in the world, most of them have not paid attention to what Jesus says in this passage. Beware of the, of the leaven of the Pharisees. And he, he was 100% correct because if you're not careful, it's going to infiltrate the universal church like leaven in the lump of dough. Now, again, I, I, I'm not here this morning to, to bash these, the particular religion. I just want you to see that Jesus knew what he was talking about yeah. when he warned us. And so he, he knows what he's talking about for us even today. So that's the reason we have to be so careful. That's the reason we have to test the spirits. That's the reason we have to know where our belief is where our faith is, where, where, where we turn for salvation. We, we need to recognize that it's not ourselves, it's not anything external. All the external things we do are so important and so wonderful, and I appreciate them, and they really intensify our, our worship, but if you take Jesus out of the middle of that, yeah. you're, you're left with nothing. Candy, you... Yeah.
that that is where the true Christianity is spreading. Uh, and, um, Interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? Candy makes the point that it is in places of persecution where true Christianity tends to be spreading. Have you ever asked yourself why? There's a great line um, from one of the movies. It's actually not a bad movie. It's called Paul the Apostle of Christ. Uh, some of you may have seen it. There's a great line where they're talking about truth with uh, the leader and, and, and Paul, or the man who plays Paul, looks at him and says, men do not die for something that they don't know is true. In other words, if you're facing death, if you're facing torture like so many of those people are, you're not a hypocrite. <laughs> It, it is a cure for hypocrisy uh, because those people long ago forsook their faith. They, 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 don't, they, they, they have caved and, and they're going to hide it. But if you're willing to be a Christian in the face of absolute persecution, it, it, it works against hypocrisy. Yeah, that's a good point. Ms. Donna. In America especially, one of the greatest institutions of hypocritical Christianity is those churches that preach a false Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I'll name the New Apostolic Reformation mm -hmm. as a big one, but that is spreading. Oh. Where you, we even have what you would think would have been evangelical pastors mm -hmm. uh, putting same-sex couples up mm -hmm. as, as leadership in their mm -hmm. church. Interesting, Donna points out that one of the greatest points or sources of uh, hypocrisy within the church today is the, the, the New Apostolic Reformation and churches who uh, 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 aspire to that. And talk about a movement that worldwide is growing at a truly alarming rate. The New Apostolic Reformation is, is that organization. And it is actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Donna, it is the very definition of external religion. Because what the New Apostolic Reformation has done, and those of you who aren't familiar, you, you hear me talk about it all the time, you should be familiar with it now. Um, it, it is neither new, it's not apostolic, and it's not reformed. It's none of those things. Um, they believe that there are apostles out there, great leaders of apostles. The pastor of the Bethel Church in California is the, one of the first that comes to mind. Uh, and, and they are more powerful and more authoritative than the biblical apostles. So therefore, you need to swear allegiance to them first because they are the leaders and the guiders and they're very charismatic and full of uh, all kinds of crazy sort of uh, spiritual things. You must uh, uh, ascribe your obedience to them first before in anything else. And it is spreading hugely, especially in developing countries like, like in Africa. Um, they have hugely powerful uh, uh, men. Now, what they have done is they have said, we are going to take the world back for Christ and we're going to do it using the world's weapons against them. So what they have done is they have infiltrated, uh, I think they have like seven or ten pillars that, that, that they follow in education and media and the church and government and, and several different literature, different things that they consider to be the, the keys that, that, that will change the way that society lives or, or the way they think. And they're saying we're going to infiltrate these for Christ. And um, unfortunately, they, they are done in secret. You don't know who they are. Um, we, unfortunately, in this church, um, sometimes we have to make tough, tough decisions. And we recently made a tough decision about um, um, one of the, uh, the, 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 the groups that creates really great songs. And we had to say, we're not going to sing those songs anymore in our church. Amen. Because they use those songs right. in a, a, a definitive way to infiltrate your church so that you are 
doing, they, 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 they put what they call prayer proclamations in their songs. So when you sing those songs on Sunday morning, in their belief, you are proclaiming word of faith. We're making God do this because we're proclaiming this. And he, they've got it in thousands of churches around the world singing their, singing their music. And so if we do that, we're, we're actually helping them to spread a horrible heresy. So, you know, we have to step back and say, wait a minute, we can't do this. Now, I've always been, and, and Byron and I have conversations, and, and Stacy have conversations about this all the time. Whenever they introduce new music, they always come to me and say, look, this is, this is not out of a new apostolic reformation, but it is out of a charismatic background. But look at the words, they're, they're, they're solid. And so I'll look at the words and I'll say, fine, they're solid words. And so the music stands on its own. I'm not going to, my goodness, do you realize what we would have to do if we didn't sing any of the hymns we sing? Uh, if we didn't agree with the guys who wrote the hymns, uh, we'd have to throw half of them out because they lived, you know, some of them uh, checkered lives. But if, if they're, so the music should stand on its own. But if the music is from a group that is trying to take the world over, by spreading itself through this music. And every time you see us with the copyright thing in the bulletin, you see that, that, that group there, you say, well, they must be okay. You know, we sing their music, so they must be okay. So we had to, and, and it's only the only criteria that we actually use. When we say that we're not going to sing that group's music, which unfortunately is the most popular music out there. You know, all the songs you recognize. Um, is, is if they are involved with the New Apostolic Reformation. If they are known prophets and uh, apostles of the New Apostolic Reformation, then we won't do it. Okay, How yes? How did you find out about that? Did Byron bring it to you? Did you see it? Or? No, I, I, they, this is what a shepherd does. And sometimes he has to do things that are unpopular, even with their, their own uh, congregation. I need to know what's going on out there. I need to know when Jezebel's trying to sneak in the back door. That's part of my job, is, is to be aware. As I told Candy, it makes me mad. I, I get righteous anger when I read what they're saying and what they're doing. And, and one of these guys, they, they've actually got a, a healing university where young Christians can go to learn how to be healers, how to heal people. They're sending them out to graveyards to lie on the graves of righteous people to absorb their righteousness, their holiness. And the, this is off the charts weird, okay? And it's going on out there. And so I need to know about that. I need to, to know. By the way, um, AGTV is coming out with a, a new um, American Gospel, two episodes, I think, two 50-minute episodes, and it is keying on the New Apostolic Reformation. Okay, that's the, that's the expose that they're doing on this time. So it should be interesting. Um, I, I've, I've seen some of, of what they do, and I wish they wouldn't be so journalistic. They're, they're, they're showing both sides of it, you know, and I wish they wouldn't. I, I mean, I, I hate to have falsehood argued by false heretics yeah, in, in, in that environment because it will lead some people astray. So I'm not going to suggest it until I see it. I, I haven't liked the, the, some of the trailers that I've seen, so. Okay, how did we get up on that? I think I started that. Oh, I did. I'm, I'm the one who started that. But the whole reason, and, and, and I actually, when I first wrote the first draft of this, that was the application, is we're going to look at, at some of the facts and figures of how the world has simply not taken Jesus to heart and they don't listen to what he says and it has worked against the church. The biggest problems that the church have are because people don't listen to Jesus. So, okay, um, I think that'll uh, 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 wrap it up um, in the case anybody has any more questions. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. You can. Um, talking about Catholics. Yes. Yeah. Right. How you were saying that in the Catholic Church there's some people that are saved. Can you explain a little bit more, a little bit that? Because I don't understand how can you stay in that church if you know what they're doing. Okay. If you know Jesus. Yeah. I don't understand. 
I, 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 I can't. The question is, as I said, that there are people in the Catholic Church who are saved. Um, I, I guess, let me, let me rephrase that, okay? I don't know that there are not people in the Catholic Church that are saved, because I don't know who's saved and who's not. Uh, only the Lord knows that. But I do know that He has people all over the place. Um, and, y you know, some Roman Catholic churches are, 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 are at least partially evangelical. There are some Roman Catholic churches that are very charismatic. Um, there are Roman Catholic churches that are very Roman Catholic. You, you know what I mean? That, that are right along it. Um, so I can't say that there are not people who are saved in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, what normally happens is, and we can take Martin Luther as a really great example. Martin, going back to, you know, the 1500s. Martin Luther was a monk, an Augustinian monk, and what he wanted to do, and almost killed himself doing, was to reform the Catholic Church. When he became saved, when he came to know the Lord, that's the first thing that he wanted to do, was to reform the church itself. And it was only after he realized that he couldn't that he made that complete break. Actually, it was the Catholic Church that condemned him and not him that left the Catholic Church. He, he wanted to reform it. So I can't say that there are people in the Catholic Church that, that th this is where their family is, this is where all the people they know, and they want to be, and, and that maybe even the Lord would keep them there as a witness to the truth. But eventually, if you really know the truth, you're going to have a hard time living a lie. You, you, yes. Yeah, well, and, 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 and but it, it, it might not have been immediate with you. It might have been immediate. Other people, their process of salvation takes time. So they might still be in the church. So that's, that's, really, that's, that, that's really what I meant. So yes, ma'am. So we were born here and where I come from, my background is all that. But I deal with a lot of people who think that that's not true. So how, how is, would that be that? Therefore, I'm in a sort of a hypocritical religion church. If they don't, because I think when they're not reformed, you don't even understand who God is. Well, um, Patty is asking um, uh, if 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 only reformed people are non-hypocrites, right? No, you, she didn't put it that way. She she didn't put it. I know she did. I'm putting words in her mouth. Uh, but you know, is our our how do we deal with different doctrines within evangel evangelical churches? Um, there's a truth and there's a non-truth, and only the God who wrote the Bible really knows the complete and total truth. We're all fallen sinners, we all have finite minds, and we all carry something to the table with us. As much as we try not to, we have our presuppositions, and we have our reading into Scripture what it says. And I'm talking about those who truly love the Lord and those who just see things differently than perhaps we do. Um, the Reformed people um, are accused of being too biblical. Um, and you know something, you can accuse me of that all day long, and, and I'm okay, I'll take that, I'll take that stigma. Um, but there are, there are dear brothers and sisters who love the Lord, who love Scripture, who read it all the time, and they just find something things different. We had a discussion about this, I think, on Wednesday uh, night, or maybe it was last week, that, you know, there is a truth. There is a right and wrong. There, and, and when we get to heaven, we'll find out what it is. Right now, I do not profess to know it in everything. I know what Scripture makes clear, and it makes most clear, okay? And I think, uh, hopefully, the people you're talking about for the most part are right on board with you as far as that which is clear, the gospel, the, those things. But like, for instance, the end times, they may have a completely different view than you. Um, baptism, they may have a completely different view of you. Um, uh, election, they may have a completely different view. Atonement, limited or universal, they may have a different view of you, okay? Um, I, I think those things are very clear in scripture and I think if you really look at scripture, um, that you'll, you'll find that. You'll find that those things are very clearly stated to you and I can, uh, I, yeah. I, 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 I just think, but I think other people, rather than calling them uh, hypocrites or heretics, 
I would say that, especially my Armenian brothers and sisters, I would say that they have never thought it completely through, that they are somewhat fuzzy, confused in their doctrine. And the clearer that you study scripture and the more you recognize this is the word of God and I don't need to change it. It's just exactly what Naomi was saying. We're going to interpret from what scripture says and how it brings it together. And that doesn't mean we're all going to agree on every single point, but it means that the answers are there if we look long and hard. Okay, I'm gonna pull it to a close because it's after one o'clock and I want you people to go home because I wanna go home. <laughs> all right, now we are gonna to try to put some of these things away if uh, you'll help and uh, set things up, but let me pray and I'll let you go. Father, how, how complicated sometimes this gets. But then again, how simple it is. As Naomi said, your word tells us, lays it out for us. It's when we stray, it's, it's when we move away from it that we run into problems. And so thank you for keeping us as close as we can. Thank you for, for opening up our hearts and minds to it. Thank you for giving us a passion for it. And, and Lord, may I as a teacher never introduce my own thoughts and opinions into things or, or, or let me make sure that I, I say that this is my opinion and, and not teach as truth something that is not your truth. I'd rather not say it. Uh, and, and so that you would hold us to the truth. Bless us as we go home. Bless everyone who is here. Bless those who are watching online. We'll give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.